point, each light had a setting of 0.41 seconds. So this is proof that Zap Pruder had set his camera at a 24 uh, frame speed and not an 18. To prove this, let's look at frame 136 to frame 144. What we are seeing at this point is there was a continuous blink of 10 frames. So if the setting was 24, which that Bruder said, this would be correct. If the setting was 18 frames per second, as the FBI determined after using Zap Reuter's camera, there would be only approximately eight blinks. So what you're seeing is the lights, in other words, the lights here represent the left side of the emergency lights. The lights on the other side of the limousine represent the right side. So this diagram proves that that the Zap Reuter film was altered. Now at this point what I would like to do is show you the Zap Reuter film and then the Ham Zap Reuter film. Notice the uh, two uh, front motorcyclists. The limousine will pop into view. Notice the movements of Roy Kellerman and Agent Greer. Notice uh, Greer shooting the president at this time. After seeing, after seeing the entire Zap Pruder film, let's examine the Abraham Zap Pruder film in some detail. Before Zap Pruder began filming the presidential motorcade on Elm Street, three lead motorcycles cyclists had already passed him by. These cyclists were Bella, McBride, and Garrick. What we are seeing in the first frame of the film are three additional motorcyclists. These are Ellis, Gray, and Lumpkin. Let's pay attention to their movements at this time. Notice their movements. At this point, one of the uh, motorcyclists is going up Houston Street. The other two cyclists are at this point turning on the elm. This cyclist continues to go up Houston Street and at the splice between one, frames 132 and 133 he and two other motorcyclists passed by uh, Zap Reuter uh, along with uh, Chief Curry's car. Let's continue. Notice the cyclist. Notice Zap Reuter panning back and forth between the cyclists as they turn onto Elm Street. Let's go back for a second and look at one key thing. At this point here, what I believe this to be is a register mark. This register mark, I believe, is used to register film. And as I said, the Zap Reuter film, I believe, was taken to the National Photographic Interpretation Center in Washington, D.C., the night of the assassination and edited. I believe this mark was used for that purpose. Let's continue. Let's continue just by watching the motorcyclist going down Elm Street. Uh, Zap Reuter just pans back and forth at this point. I want to draw your attention at this point. Notice the occupants in this area. What will happen in just a, a few seconds is all the occupants taking photographs on Houston Street will run with their cameras into this area. When the limousine pops into view in frame 133 you will see the, pe the photographers in this area but at this point the space is practically vacant. Let's continue. Notice the motorcyclists. Notice that we are panning back and forth. Now at this point here this is frame 132. This frame is the last frame taken of the motorcyclist and the very next frame is the limousine pops into view. What I believe is occurring at this time is that editing was done to uh, knock out 
so you wouldn't be able to see uh, Chief Curry's blinking lights on the car. It would be very evident uh, by the blinking lights on his car that the film was edited. I believe this is why fr frame 132 to 133 was spliced. Also, let's direct our attention here, and what we are looking at is Philip Willis. Philip Willis takes a photograph at uh, 139 and 189. Let's continue. Notice as the motorcyclists approach uh, Willis that he begins stepping back on the curve. I don't believe, uh, Gerald Posner believed that a shot occurred at 161, but I believe the people reacting in this area are reacting, getting out of the way of the motorcyclists. They are not responding to a shot. Let's continue. Notice the cyclist, I'm sorry, notice the uh, the various people in the background taking photographs. Uh, what is key about this frame, this is Hugh Bexner at this point, and I believe the splice that we had just saw earlier was to hide his rapid movement. Let's let's try see if we can uh, pick this up. His movement would be impossible between the, uh, the frames before the splice came to get in this location. Let's look in this area to observe that feature. Okay, again, this is 139. This is when Willis. Willis is taking his fourth photograph at this point. Let's direct our attention up in this area. Now between 139 and 161, let's watch the rapid movement. Now at the splice there, you can see uh, Hugh Bexner uh, running around onto Elm Street. There's a splice at 154. There's also notice that 161. He's in a location to take a photograph at this point. This is an impossible movement. Also notice that uh, Rosemary Willis is running along alongside uh, the car on on in the grassy area. She's following the car until she hears the first shot. Let's continue. Now, as, as, a, as the car approaches the Stemmons Road sign, Philip Willis said that at frame 189, this, I believe this is when the uh, shot occurred, at frame 189, Philip Willis heard, heard the uh, first shot, and he took this photograph at this point, his fifth photograph, and I believe the president is hit, is hit at this point. Now, what we want to watch it was Kennedy is waving at, with his right arm, and then in the next several frames, what he'll be doing, re he'll be reacting to the shot. So he'll ro lower his right hand towards his face, and also to turn forward. Let's continue. Notice Kennedy turning forward at this point. In other words, now, at this point here, notice there is no bullet hole in the windshield at this point. This is frame 200. I believe that the shot that uh, struck Kennedy in the throat occurred sometime between 200 and frame 218. Let's continue to watch Kennedy. Uh, at this point, Kennedy's right arm is going is going towards his face as as he is reacting to being hit at frame 189 from frame uh, 202 to frame 205 uh, Kennedy's right hand remains static so I believe this is why I believe a shot occurred at approximately uh, Z206 from the front that transited through the uh, windshield and struck the president in the throat Let's continue on. Notice the splice. I believe that was when the throat shot occurred. Now in my frame of film, uh, I can see the bullet hole in this area. Notice that someone had uh, inked this area. Uh, why, I do not know. Let's continue.
Now at this point, let's look at Governor Conley. Now Governor Conley is smiling at this point, and what he is doing, he's wondering, he heard the shot, and he is turning around uh, to his rear uh, to check out the sound of the shot. Let's, let's watch Kennedy's motion, Conley's motion at this point. Now at this point, Governor Conley has been hit. The shot was fired from the rear. It struck uh, Conley in the back, exited out uh, through his chest just below his right uh, nipple and then to the floorboard. Now this can be proven, uh, Jeff Boats had pr proven this because be between frames 224 and 225 you can actually see Conley's uh, suit lapel flip. So between uh, this frame and the next, the lapel flips. What we want to draw our attention to at this point is the apron man. This is the apron man and what he is doing up until this point is clapping. After the sound has reached his ears, what he will do, he will swing his both arms downward in a clockwise manner, indicating that, a shot, that he heard a shot at the frame 224. Notice his movement. Let's direct our attention back to Governor Conley at this point. Uh, first of all, Kennedy has been struck in the back at this point at Z189, in the throat at Z206. The governor has been hit at 224, and at this point, is, uh, the, the air in his lungs is being ex... Is, the wind has actually been knocked out of him, and you can see his cheeks puffing at this point. Notice uh, Roy Kellerman uh, observing uh, in the rearview mirror that both uh, the governor and uh, Kennedy has been shot and is doing nothing at this point except watching. Let's continue. Notice uh, Conley uh, yelling at this point uh, in pain, but he, what he does, instead of falling back into his uh, wife's Nellie's lap at this point, he continues to turn around to get a better view of Kennedy. Let's continue. While he was doing this, at this point, William Robert Greer and Roy Kellerman are in the process. Well, Greer has already turned around looking at the president to, at this time. He should have taken off at this point, but instead he is turning around doing nothing just observing the president. He lied in his testimony. He said that this this was the time he turned around and uh, stepped on the accelerator. This is not true. Also, notice this is uh, Roy Kellerman. And now, this is the first time what he's doing. He's uh, from Z249. He is in the process of turning around. Uh, he's get re getting ready to uh, grab the microphone. We'll see this in the next couple frames. Okay, now what we want to watch is right here. What we're seeing is the very tip of Roy Kellerman's right hand. Now at this point he's grabbing the microphone uh, in his right hand and also turning uh, to look back at the uh, occupants in the rear of the, of the rear of the car. Now, this is Greer's right hand. Notice uh, you cannot see his left hand. This is his right hand on the steering wheel. Let's continue. Both at this point are turned around looking at the president. This, what we are seeing in the background, this is the babushka lady here, and this is Charles Bain and his son. They are, uh, they're clapping at this time. Now, what is interesting at this point, uh, this is Jean Hill in red, and this is Mary Mormon. And what's key about this this photograph in the next two frames um, 
Kennedy will be struck in the back of the head. Let's continue. Okay, at this point here, although it is quite faint, what we can see is a vapor trail. The vapor trail can be seen going into Kennedy's stall at this time. Because uh, the film isn't raised, uh, you cannot see the vapor trail going through the, the front of Kennedy's frontal lobe at this point into Conley's wrist. Let's continue. Also notice that when the 295 shot was fired, that both uh, Kellerman and Greer were turning to the front and were unaware of the shot. Now at this point, from here on, um, let's watch uh, Roy, Roy, I mean Secret Service Agent Greer. Now what he does, at this point here, about frame 300, he begins to turn around, and at this time I believe he's preparing to shoot the president. Let's continue. Now this is uh, one eighteenth of a second prior to the fatal headshot. The fatal headshot, well actually there were two. There was one at uh, 295 and one at 313. What is key about this is why the 295 headshot was missed is because Jacqueline is moving along with her husband in coordination with her husband so the movement of Kennedy to the front at that point is concealed. Let's, let's go back and see if we can uh, observe this. Okay, no, notice Jacqueline moving along with her husband. Notice that movement. That's why I believe it was the vapor trail at the 295 shot was not picked up. Now at this point again, this is Greer turning around. I believe at this point he's ready to shoot the president. Okay, at this point I believe the president was shot by William Robert Greer from the front. And uh, what's interesting about this is I believe this is a composite frame. And then I, I believe editing was done between frames 312 and uh, 313, but the shot did occur here. Well, most people believe that the fatal shot occurred at 313. I, I believe that to be the case. Now let's continue. Now what's interesting here is what we want to do is direct our attention to uh, to uh, Roy Kellerman and William Greer. Now, from this, this is frame 315. Now, at this point, he's looking directly back at the president, Greer. Kellerman, at, at this point, is looking forward. Uh, at, at this point in the Mary Muchmore film, he is using the microphone, although you can see his left hand uh, at that, this point. Now in the next uh, five, uh, five frames, William Robert Greer turns 165 degrees to the front. This is an impossibility. Let's watch this. Notice the movement. Now Greer has turned 165 degrees in five frames. The quickest anyone could do this is 0.68 seconds and yet uh, Greer had done this in five frames. This is an impossibility. Now what we want to do is the last shot I believe occurred at frame three, uh, three uh, two nine and what we're looking at here is is the flare and in other words, the last shot, I believe, fired from Oswald's rifle struck the chrome strip. And what we're seeing here is the glare uh, off of the debris of, uh, of the chrome. And that's what we're picking up in the film. Again, it's much, at this point, it has its greatest intensity. And so I'm saying the last shot completely missed all the occupants in the car. Let's continue. 
Notice uh, Jacqueline at this point. Now what Jacqueline is doing is she had uh, seen a piece of her husband's brain on the trunk. Now Clint Hill at this point is has just reached the the uh, rear of the limousine, but he does not he he does not assist her back into the uh, limousine. Notice uh, her her knees are uh, in the on the uh, on the uh, back seat. She never uh, climbed literally onto the trunk of the car. She, her knees were always uh, inside the car. Let's continue to watch this. Limousine was going under the triple underpass. I, like I had said earlier, I believe a shot occurred at frame 206 in this location. But if we just look up at this point here, right here, I believe there was a person on the triple um, overpass at this point. And uh, although I believe the sniper fired underneath, there are a couple people in this location. I just wanted to point that out. Let's continue at this point. This is the last frame of the Zap Ruder film, and at this point, let's end. The After examining the Zap Ruder film, let's close at this point. I hope this video has enlightened you and that you feel like myself that a conspiracy occurred on November 22nd, 1963, which resulted in the death of President John F. Kennedy. If you do feel a conspiracy took place, please tell others about this. President Kennedy was a great man. He had his faults, but President John F. Kennedy was one of the greatest presidents that ever served this nation. So at this, on this note, uh, thank you and God bless.